uh, I'll use something else. I'll call the Jobs and Economic Development Committee to order. Um, and this morning, we are, we're not going to be taking any votes, members. Um, uh, we're going to be going over what we have done in work, to some extent, what we've done in workforce training uh, and where the path leads to the future. Uh, it's been pretty unprecedented. Uh, last year, we had about 70 or 75,000 people that were unemployed at this time or throughout the full year. Um, uh, today, we have 450,000 that are unemployed, all within, or most all within the last uh, 30 days, 45 days. So um, with that, I'm, I'm going to move, I'm going to ask uh, Representative uh, Zong, I'm sure you had a chance to take a look at the uh, minutes from the March 5th meeting. Would you move those particular minute, minutes? I'll move, Mr. Chair. All those in favor of the minutes as written, please signify by saying aye. 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 We have those minutes taken care of. And then uh, I just threw the other minutes away. We have another set that we have to approve. Let's see if I have those. Oh, yes. Now, Representative Gunter, I'm sure you got a chance to take a look at the minutes from March 12th. Would you move those minutes for the committee? Uh, Rep Go ahead, Representative. I will Gunther. certainly move those minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Representative Gunther. Uh, all those in favor of the March 12th minutes as written, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. We have those. So, uh, so I will uh, I will continue on my uh, introduction here. Uh, we have five, uh, six testifiers. That are all going to be we're going to be in we have just a short amount of time. Uh, right now, it's difficult to get a committee time. Uh, we typically have four committees that meet at any one time, uh, but the capacity for um, these kind of Zoom meetings where the public can call in and, and, and watch the, uh, the, the proceedings is limited to two at a time. So um, we were gonna have this meeting last Tuesday and we got bumped. Uh, I don't know how many more meetings we'll be able to squeeze in. So I, I do know that we are going to have an unprecedented uh, need of training for our 450,000 people that are laid off. Um, I'd like for uh, our fiscal analyst to go over the two sheets that she sent out. One is a spreadsheet of financing for a workforce over the last several years. And the other is, uh, um, it's a sheet from the UI that talks about the numbers that uh, are unemployed. So uh, if we could get uh, Ms. Beckel to go over the, um, the spreadsheet she sent out yesterday or were sent out yesterday, I will, then we'll proceed with our witnesses. Mr. Chair and members, uh, yes, I'll start with the spreadsheet for the Workforce Development Fund. Um, many of you have seen the consolidated fund statements that MMB puts out um, with each forecast. Uh, this is sort of a combination of consolidated fund statements for the Workforce Development Fund um, from 2006 extended out to the furthest forecast, 2023. Um, this is just to show what has been used out of the Workforce Development Fund. Um, something that is a little confusing perhaps um, is if you look at the February forecast fiscal year 2020, um, it shows that the dislocated worker program has 
nearly $53 million going to it. Um, this represents not so much actual dollars as it does MMB's estimates for what the account will receive over the course of a year. Um, we can expect this number to be less. Um, the amount that is currently um, in the account for the dislocated worker program is roughly $44 million. Um, so just keep that in mind. And now I'm gonna switch over to the Word document. Um, so here you can just, this is just data from DEED. Um, very clearly food preparation and services workers are the most um, impacted by this in terms of employment. There's nearly 82,000 people from that sector who are unemployed. Um, and then as we continue down, you can see just the, the different sectors that have been impacted. Um, and admittedly, the, the food preparation is most heavily impacted, but there are a lot of industries, of course, that have been impacted by this. Um, then if you follow down, you can take a look at just a pie chart showing this phenomenon. And then if we go to the third page, this is where I break down the amount spent or obligated each year since 2011, which is what the state accounting system, the SWIFT system shows, um, going back to 2011. Um, and if you exclude 2011, which was a year that was a significant outlier in terms of dislocated worker spending, um, the dislocated worker program uses about 25 million each year on average. Um, you can take a look at the differing numbers throughout the years. Um, so right now with that 44 million figure I gave you, um, the dislocated worker program has either expended or obligated about 19 million. Um, and it has about 25 million in the account that it still can spend, can obligate. Um, with that, uh, I can just answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Well, I will, I will just say this, because then I'm going to move on to our testifiers, unless someone, unless I get notified, apparently somebody has to raise their hand or signal to Josh or Michael, um, the seat, my committee administrator and my committee legislative assistant, um, uh, that you want to ask a question. My biggest fear is that with 25 million unallotted at this particular point, and last year, uh, they spent $22.5 million with 75,000 unemployed. We now have 450. Uh, we need to be thinking about what we will be asking out of the CARE uh, Act uh, to put aside for workforce training, uh, dislocated worker program. Um, so with that being said, are there any questions for uh, our fiscal analysts? Seeing none, um, I wanna- Mr. Chair? Up. Yes. Um, so I have a question about how many of those people um, that are currently unemployed, do we anticipate needing to go through the dislocated workers program versus um, who are just furloughed or um, are going to return to their normal jobs once um, this has all passed? I'm certainly hoping to find out a reasonable estimate, uh, um, uh, a reasonable estimate uh, from our testifiers today, particularly from Deed. That may be asking a lot and it is only an estimate that they may have. Uh, we don't know, but I'm going to I, I want to be prepared for the worst. 
So I can't really Mr. answer Chair. your question. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I've got one quick question. The balance on the uh, uh, Workforce Development Fund shows uh, $1 million. So it's, it's a little bit confusing how much we have in the reserve uh, or in the balance. At the same time, if you look at the question about the industries that are impacted the most, the hospitality industry has been impacted. The retail uh, temp workers have been impacted the most. So the question that I have is, these are the same uh, category of folks who are in our public uh, service uh, or system programs. So the question that I'm trying to raise is, how are we going to be able to provide the workforce development resources to those industries? So I'll take my questions uh, off the line if, if, it, if it's necessary. Um, we don't know yet, to be honest. Um, what I am hoping is to put a request in to the speaker and the governor and work with represent, uh, Senator Pratt in the Senate to find a reasonable estimate that we can say out of the CARES Act, we need another 25 or $50 million. So the general fund is, uh, any surplus that we had was an estimate and uh, I'm told we're gonna get another update soon. Uh, I believe that update will show no surplus and uh, actually probably a deficit. So the only place I see this money being able to come from is out of the CARES Act money, the coming from the federal government, uh, which I think totals a little over $2 billion. I hope that answers your question, Representative Nora. Uh, I just wanted to check in on the fund balance, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Beckhall? Uh, Mr. Chair and members, that is a very confusing part of the fund statements from MMB with regard to the Workforce Development Fund. Um, the statement is designed in such a way that it assumes that all but one million of the Workforce Development Fund that has not been otherwise appropriated by the legislature will be spent on the dislocated worker program. If you look at past years, however, you can see that this is generally not the case. Um, the general balance before reserves or the budgetary balance um, is significantly more than 1 million, except for when you look back at the years um, associated with the Great Recession. Um, and you can see that those the the um, reserve has gone down significantly. But that one million that that's just um, how MMB uh, use writes the fund statement. Um, so what I can say now is that the dislocated worker program line for fiscal year twenty. Um, about nineteen million has been obligated or expended, and there is 25 million left, um, but it, it is possible that there will only be 1 million left on the bottom line, but there is 25 million still to work with before the end of fiscal year 2020 on June 30th. Are there any other questions? Seeing none. Uh, I'm going to move to our uh, testifiers. And first up is Deeds Deputy Commissioner of Workforce Development, Hasami Worf. I probably am not pronouncing that correctly, but that goes in, um, that goes in keeping with my bad ability to pronounce people's names for the last 20 years. So if the Deputy Commissioner could uh, unmute and uh, introduce himself for the tape. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, this is Hamza Warfa. I am perfectly okay with, uh, even within my family, I get different uh, pronunciations, so you're fine. Uh, thank you so much for having us this morning. Uh, with me is my uh, deputy, uh, sorry, director of employment training program, uh, Mark Majors. Um, with regards to some of the questions about the uh, dislocated worker uh, program, uh, we will have some uh, update, but I want to start off with 
providing a kind of high overview of where we are with workforce development uh, program and the uh, COVID impact on the system. And what I would like to do is, in the interest of time, divide this into three areas. Uh, one is, how has our services been impacted? Uh, given that, you know, stay home order and career force locations being closed down. Uh, and so over the last month, uh, most of our services have been pivoted towards uh, virtual services. So we continue to see uh, uh, folks utilizing uh, career force uh, virtual services. Those include one-on-one -on -one, uh, interview scale development. It looks at uh, job search. Uh, we do uh, group trainings. Our employers access career force uh, services by posting jobs, although we're seeing lower number compared to same time last year. Uh, so overall, we're seeing about 1,300 people, uh, uh, new, register, uh, new people who register our career force services. That is about 200, about average of 200 people more than same time last year. Uh, so that continues to uh, be of service to people. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we realize that unemployment insurance uh, might not be sufficient uh, for many people. We also realize that there are folks in our community that want to be in the essential services industry in this time of crisis and provide you know, support. Uh, and so we are able to uh, provide weekly vacancy uh, openings uh, and we publish that on our website and via social media. Uh, last week I published a blog that um, showed the nine occupations that are in demand, significant demand uh, for workers. Uh, so that has been uh, well received in the communities. Uh, the other area that I would like to quickly mention is that uh, we are doing a career, a virtual career fair. In fact, the first one is today. We have close to 500 people, uh, who, job seekers who signed up, uh, and we have about 10 employers uh, participating uh, that today at, at 2 p.m. Uh, and so that's happening. On the other hand, given that most of our partners are not able to provide face-to-face uh, -face services, uh, so they are really challenged with uh, providing all of the services virtually. The, no one expected this, obviously, and uh, no, you know, a lot of our partners do not have the necessary equipment uh, to provide 100% you know, virtual services. Having said that, a uh, number of our uh, nonprofit uh, providers continue to do remote access and remote services. And to alleviate and help the situation, we have provided support by uh, looking at grant extensions, a uh, number of grants were due in June of this year. Uh, so we provided opportunity for nonprofit providers to uh, request an extension uh, for the grant up to one year. We have also, in some instances, allowed 10% uh, cash advances if an organization is providing virtual services and they need uh, an immediate you know, uh, cash uh, to continue their services. That has also been of service to our community uh, organizations. We continue to work with the Federal Department of Labor, uh, looking at you know, uh, potential waivers uh, for performance you know, uh, formula, uh, as well as you know, funding opportunities as it, like, it, as it uh, relates to dislocated worker program uh, and the various other uh, opportunities for funding. We are actively searching for uh, third party online courses, uh, focusing on industries in demand. Uh, there are courses in like CNA and some of the other programs that our providers are very interested. In. And so we're trying to provide as many uh, courses and virtual services as possible. Uh, as uh, Chair Mahoney mentioned, you know, 400, uh, even as of this morning, we have 485,000 people on UI. And it's very likely that, you know, uh, a significant portion of uh, those workers might not go back to their work. So what kind of training do they need? And how do we uh, align uh, today's workforce needs? And while, you know, looking at the adjacent issues of uh, transportation barriers and uh, virtual accessibility. And so those are critical needs in the workforce space. 
Uh, so we are uh, monitoring the effect of COVID-19, uh, we, you know, in, as it relates to what our partners provide and what the needs of our communities are. I'm going to pause there for a second and uh, invite my colleague, uh, Mark Major, to provide a quick update on the Dislocated Worker Fund and uh, some of the policy-related issues that we have been discussing internally. Mark? Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Chairman Mahoney, and the members of the committee. Uh, good morning. Um, when we look at the Workforce Development Fund, um, what we see is that uh, currently we have roughly about $24 million that is left in the fund, 24 to 25 million. About 7 uh, million of that is part of the MJSP um, portion of the, um, of the fund. And then there's actually $17 million as an obligated um, uh, for the dislocated worker portion. Um, if you go back and you look at history of the Workforce Development Fund, there is, has been over the years, the last few years that I've seen, uh, carried, uh, between 15 to $17 million is kind of carried forward every year. Um, so we are about where we, we've been in the last few years. Um, in terms of the um, processes that we're looking at, the worker program, I think Deputy Commissioner Warfa said it correctly, is we're trying to be as flexible as we possibly can with our policies within the spirit of the law and sure there's opportunities for folks to receive our services. Um, I'll just echo the sentiment because of the situation. Um, it is challenging to uh, get to our, our our participants and our job seekers um, because of the um, stay in shelter. Um, I would just like to add, there's other things that we have to consider as well is as computer equipment um, uh, and other things for our participants. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Mr. Chair, if I can have just less than a minute uh, here, uh, what I would like to also add here is uh, we continue to engage communities. Uh, as you can imagine, in this, this time of crisis, we're getting an unprecedented calls and requests. And so we have weekly meetings that we set up. Uh, sometimes it's about UI, sometimes it's about the small business, but a lot of times it's about uh, workforce needs. And so we have a weekly call with uh, workforce partners and we have uh, community calls three times a week. And we are also available to uh, requests from legislators. Uh, so with that, I turn over to uh, the Chair Mahoney for any questions. And Chair Representative Robbins does have a question. Uh, I, I'm sorry, who has a question? Hey, Chair, uh, Representative Kristen Robbins has a question. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Good morning. Thank you to our testifiers. I have so many questions, but I get one. So I'm going to roll it all in. Um, could you tell me, a, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Chair, if, if you could tell me how, who has been applying for these extensions that go up to one year and how do they hear about it? And is it a competitive process and who makes the decision of who gets these extensions? And if you could address uh, the computer equipment that the partners need, what types of equipment, I'm assuming most have laptops and can do Zoom calls like we're doing. So what other things do they need? And um, uh, how, what's the process for getting some of this care money as a committee? Like, what should we be doing to advocate for that? Thank you. Boy, that almost sounded like cheating, but go right ahead. Uh, Chair Mahoney and Representative Robbins. Yeah. Uh, and so I'll take the first part of the uh, question. Uh, so we, the way we have posted uh, communication to all of our grantees, so this is only applicable to our current grantees. Uh, so we have reached out uh, via email, we have communicated, we, we've posted a blog post on our website and via social media. Over the last three weeks, we had 85, sorry, 87 providers uh, reached out to DEED uh, with different forms of uh, grant related, you know, uh, modifications or requests. Out of that, 37 have been uh, processed for modifications. Uh, these include, you know, grant extensions or Mostly, uh, the decisions are within the guidelines of and the statutes, you know, uh, with the, following the guidance of the Department of Admin. Uh, so, cash advances of up to 10%. Uh, 
uh, Debris uh, Director uh, Mark Majors approves that. And anything above uh, 10% and lower than 50%, I approve as the Deputy Commissioner. Uh, often our requests are, are in the range of about 10% cash advances. Uh, so those changes are uh, within the deed policies and uh, different level of approvals are already in place uh, to process those. Uh, Mark, if you want to address the issue of uh, computer equipment. Sure. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and committee members. Yes, uh, com uh, and I think the question is around whether or not the, the partners have uh, laptops. I think a majority of our partners have actually have computers, hard computers on their desk, desktops. Um, and so that poses a challenge, not only for um, being able to bring and do your work at home, um, but also just having um, updated computer equipment at, at their actual sites. And then we're gonna get into a situation um, with the given um, circumstances of actually uh, social distancing. Um, and making sure that we can have the space to spread out, but that we can have the computers that we can do that. So we go towards laptops so that we can create social distancing for our participants and our users of our system. Thank you. Thank you. And I think, Chair, we also have a question from Representative Haley. Representative Haley, if you would proceed. Uh, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I think my question is for uh, Director Majors. Uh, can you confirm the uh, automation grants that Deed put out? Uh, is it a pot? Is it possible that my understanding is those grants weren't fully utilized? If could we move that grant money into the MJSP program, and then can you confirm that those two next? grant cycle rounds for the uh, MJSP grants uh, will proceed as planned. I think they are August and November. Mr. Majors. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Haley. That is, uh, I may have to defer to uh, Deputy Commissioner Warfar on that on that question. Um, as those, questions, those uh, pots of money sit with our economic development side of our house, and I work on the um, workforce development side. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Representative Ali, we, uh, so it was the pilot, automation pilot was $500,000 grant uh, with, for companies, manufacturing companies that have uh, employees of less than 100. Uh, my understanding is that uh, first, pro uh, first portion of that have been processed. I am not, I can get you the details. It's on the economic development side, not on the workforce development side of the department, uh, but I'd be happy to provide additional information. As a Thank you so much. Uh, and Commission, Deputy Commissioner Warfa, I suspect there'll be a lot of questions that you will have to uh, go back and take a look at. Uh, and rather than just send it to Representative Haley, could you send it to Representative Haley, but also to, uh, my CA, Michael Moeller, and he can get that shared with the rest of the committee. Yes, we'll do that, Chairman Honey. Thank you. Um, uh, is there, are there any other questions? Anyone else raise their hand? I love that raise the hand stuff. Oh, Sends no. me back to my grade school years. Um, Chair Mahoney? Yes. This is okay. Representative Gunther. I, I have a question for the Deputy Commissioner. Is there any way we can create a virtual career force center using the services that they have by advertising telephone numbers that they can reach those people from every career force in, center in the state, such as job postings and, and uh, job training opportunities and stuff like that? Chair Mahoney, Representative uh, Gunther, uh, I'm excited to share that we have already launched that. It's called careerforcemn.com, uh, 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 where we post uh, job openings. We have uh, virtual one-on-one -on -one counseling, uh, resume exploration, all of that done virtually. And people can call in, they can send emails, uh, they can access uh, webinars. Uh, in fact, today's uh, career fair is all virtual and it's being done through the Career Force uh, MN website. And 
uh, obviously we're using a uh, low tech now uh, to get the actual uh, career fair, but the phase two of what we're trying to do is develop uh, these virtual online trainings uh, for the next one year uh, and beyond. Uh, we anticipate somewhere between 80 to 100,000 people might access online courses. Uh, and so the initial phase uh, has been done and people are now accessing most of these services online uh, virtually on our website. Uh, but the longer term, this is a area of need uh, for uh, investments to look at you know uh, virtual online, online trainings uh, so we're working with the feds and others to see what courses can be uh, pivoted to online uh, with certifications and we, uh, we owe a, you know meeting we owe requirements uh, so that's also phase two already in progress uh, my second question is how do people know that this, these services are available? Are you promoting or advertising them in any way? And uh, I'm sure newspapers would gladly provide that service free. Radio stations could do the same thing. Representative Ganther, yeah, we, we advertise via online and we connect with uh, both ethnic media and mainstream media, radios, uh, free advertisements. Uh, we also do minimal paid subscription for, uh, for wider distribution. Uh, we are very happy that, you know, most of our major news uh, outlets also uh, carry and promote some of these programs. Uh, we're more than welcome to receive additional uh, requests and information to disseminate, you know, the available uh, resources. And Deputy Commissioner Warfa. If I may jump in here, uh, because my good friend, Mr. Uh, Representative Gunther, uh, jumped into a second question. I'm going to uh, say one question, please. Uh, but I actually, we all have, all of our members have uh, electronic email newsletters that we send out. And many of us have extensive newsletter subscriptions. Um, if you could send us some of that information about how we connect, how we could ask, uh, tell our constituents how to connect, um, um, you know, that would be important for us to be able to put that into our electronic newsletters and any other information or uh, how we could get, what are they called, public service announcements on TV and on, on radio, because many of us, particularly outside the you know, the 10 county metro area have um, smaller cable units that put that kind of stuff up and are looking to do those kind of things. So please share that with us, with the committee members. Um, I have one piece that I would like you, and I'm asking uh, rather forcefully here, that uh, we kind of need cost. Now you just talked about 100,000 people participating in a, uh, some kind of e-training or e-connection. Uh, what's that cost? And is that gonna be able to be covered by the 25 million that is still in the workforce uh, training fund? Um, and how many participants do you, is that 100,000? A question was asked earlier by Representative uh, Cagle, I think, uh, how we're going to know how many people will be taking advantage of, of your services. So I really, as the committee chair, would like to get from you, what do you need from us in terms of dollars? And you know, we need an estimate because otherwise we're pulling figures out of the air and that's not appropriate. And um, how many folks you expect to be using your services? Because we need that also to understand how much we have to go and ask uh, the speaker and the majority leader in the Senate to uh, reasonably fund you for a year. This is a huge crisis, crisis. and we hope most people get a, to go back to their old job, but unlikely, unlikely. So I'm making that request and I would actually prefer it by Monday or Tuesday of next week because we have less than a month left the session. Um, and with that, I, unless there's another question, I'm going to go on to our Chair, next testifier. Uh, Representative Hassan does have a question. Oh. Representative Hassan, please go ahead. Uh, good morning, um, 
Mr. Chair and members. Um, my question is uh, related to unemployment insurance. I, um, as it relates to uh, non-English speakers, I get at least few calls a day about unemployment insurance and um, people are really getting confused about not having access to a computer. How do you apply? There's a phone number. The phone number is always busy. So is, does DEED have plans to um, create a, you know, a better system because the system that's in place is not uh, super friendly to people who are non-English speakers? And what kind of support have you guys been providing um, for unemployment, people who are applying for unemployment? That don't speak English? Yes. You don't have access to computers? Yes. Uh, Chair, Deputy Commissioner. Yeah. Chair Mahoney, uh, Representative Hassan, members of the committee. Uh, we overall, as you can imagine, the number of uh, unemployment uh, insurance requests are uh, significantly higher than the capacity that was in place in the past. So I want to start off by sharing that, you know, in the past uh, 60 hours on a weekly basis uh, was the time available for uh, applying to UI. We have increased that now to 84 hours uh, a week. Uh, we also increased the staffing uh, with you know hundreds of hours of overtime and over 50 additional staff. Specifically, as relates to language, we have uh, phone lines that are specifically dedicated to Somali, Spanish, uh, Hmong, uh, and I realize uh, that you know the capacity, the the need always outweighs the uh, the capacity at hand. Uh, so we're asking some patients and counsel. We're trying our best to be as responsible as responsible as possible to uh, address the needs of communities. What we're also doing is, uh, as of yesterday, we're providing the train the trainer. Uh, so we're asking our nonprofit providers to also help us in assisting uh, community members, their neighbors who need to apply to UI. Uh, and and so we we I think at this stage we're going to see a more uh, available uh, slots uh, for people to call in to apply online. We have provided online videos. We have online web page that UI converted completely in Somali uh, and also in Spanish and in Hmong. Uh, and so the services, uh, you know, are being provided in multiple languages. Uh, but I will agree with you that you know the need far outweighs the capacity at hand now. And we're doing our best uh, to respond to that. Thank you. Representative Hassan, to your one question, I appreciate that. No, um, I, I, I will just do quickly a follow up. And then uh, the community call that DEED does, um, it says that you have to submit questions ahead of time. Can I make the suggestion that people don't submit questions because uh, if people, if, if accessibility is an issue and people don't submit their questions and they get on the call, uh, there's no way for them to ask questions. So um, I know you guys are trying your best to, to be accessible to the community, but that's a barrier that I have seen for the people that I've told to get on the call with uh, the community call with Deed. So if you guys can maybe, you know, work something out so people can ask questions if they got on the line and they didn't have a chance to submit their questions. That would be great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Deputy Thank you. Commissioner Hamza. Um, I'm going to finish this and move on to our next testifier. Uh, but I will say this. This is not the first time I've gone through one of these crises. This is probably the most significant crisis I've gone through on unemployment and, and our economy. And this is not Deputy Commissioner Orfa's uh, area of expertise, unemployment. Uh, we have a system that was designed by people that look like me uh, with not quite the understanding of what it is for a community of color or a community of immigrants. Uh, we need to do a much, much better job. And I am not berating you or criticizing you at this particular point. Uh, we need to get to that particular point. And Deputy Commissioner, I expect you to bring this message back to uh, the UI folks. Uh, I, I have talked to a couple of the 
folks in charge over there. And uh, we have all had our moments of stress. I think those folks really deserve a huge applause for the amount of work they've gotten done. But we need to do a much, much better job of how we connect with these communities because many of these communities are the ones that are most living close to the edge and are very, very stressed about how they're gonna pay their rent, how they're gonna pay uh, you know, the, the, the food bill. Uh, you have many people stay, uh, what is it, stay, uh, uh, staying home every day, so the food consumptions are higher. Uh, we have trouble with multiple pieces of the food piece for these uh, families. So we need to do, to do a better job. The UI system needs to do a much, much better job with this. And uh, I know it's hard, but you've been trained for these particular types of incidences. So I wanna thank you. Oh, I also wanna say, again, I'm looking for estimates of cost and participation and what your, what your plan is, how you're gonna do it, who you're gonna train, what are you gonna train them in? Where is your focus of training? And how soon do you think you'll be ready to do that? So thank you much for coming today. Um, I'm, you can stay on the line uh, if there's a question a little later on, if we get done with our testifiers, we'll open it up to questions for those that are here. So with that, uh, I'm gonna call, I think it's Jennifer uh, Fortney, Director of Minnesota Association of Workforce Boards. And, Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, could, you you. could you introduce yourself for the tape? Yes, my name is Gina Fortney, F-O-R-T-N-E-Y. I'm the director of the Minnesota Association of Workforce Boards. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, the Minnesota Association of Workforce Boards includes the 16 local workforce development boards across the state appointed by local elected officials. These boards are responsible for the strategic investment of employment and training funding in their communities. I'm testifying today to share the impact of COVID-19 on the local workforce boards and the public workforce system. Minnesota's local workforce boards serve all 87 counties and have continued to work with job seekers and employers through virtual and remote methods since COVID-19 health concerns necessitated the closure of career force locations. We're continuing to provide a myriad of services over the telephone, email, and web-based platforms, including intake, enrollment, and orientation for federal and state employment and training programs, providing support services to eligible participants, transitioning our youth work experience participants to online activities, conducting career networking groups, helping customers find essential resources, and sending jobs job listings to clients and assisting with job search for industries still hiring, among many others. Despite our ability to quickly change our service model due to the public health crisis, many of our programs and services have been affected. Participant education and training opportunities have been suspended. Many who were employed through the assistance of our programs have been laid off. Work experiences have been cut short and we face barriers to serving some customers due to program regulations and access to technology by our participants. As a result, our program performance will certainly look different than what we had planned, but we are going to prioritize to the best of our ability, the most critical interventions for Minnesota's communities. MOB has been working closely with DEED on these concerns and recently submitted a list of waiver suggestions for both state and federal programs, which would allow us the flexibility to adapt and meet the needs of participants under current circumstances. One example is we are seeking flexibility on what percentage of funds can be spent on training programs versus support services, acknowledging at this time our participants will have greater needs in the area of support services. We are hopeful DEED will be an ally in advocating for any legislative changes that may be needed as we move forward. There are many unknowns at this point regarding the short and long-term impacts on Minnesota's economy and specific industries. We are planning for a large number of dislocated workers in the coming weeks and months and are currently strategizing to prepare for an influx. We don't have a specific funding request at this time. We are currently using existing funding and are seeking additional federal funding through the National Emergency Grants in partnership with DEED. And local areas are looking at requesting funding through the Minnesota Job Skills Partnership at their next meeting in June. However, if the state wants to deploy additional resources quickly, 
local workforce boards are strategically positioned to carry this out as we work across all counties in coordination with economic development and a wide number of partners and community-based organizations. Any new workforce efforts should be aligned with our existing WIOA state plan and regional plans. This will ensure we are filling any gaps and reinforcing our existing workforce infrastructure and not duplicating existing services. MOB also urges the state to maintain the purpose of the Workforce Development Fund for Dislocated Worker Services. This fund is our first line of defense to serve a large number of Minnesotans who have been laid off as a result of COVID-19, and we need to ensure that funding is there for this purpose. I would like to thank the chair and members for the committee for allowing me to testify today would be happy to take any questions you may have. Do members have questions for the area workforce uh, boards? Anyone raising their hand? Negative. Uh, hearing none, I have a cu couple of questions for you. Um, again, the areas of training that you expect to have to upgrade. Do you have that now or is that something you're still working on? Um, we're still working on strategizing that. Um, we know that there are specific industries such as, you know, obviously healthcare um, that is going to have a big need in the coming months. Um, and so we're looking at what online training opportunities there are there. Um, and I'm happy to give you more specifics um, later. Um, there's, in the industry around, uh, from those that I've talked to in, in industry, there is a big expectation that there will be, um, there will be businesses bringing back their manufacturing from uh, the Far East, uh, Asia, China. Um, now, if that actually works out, that's wonderful for Minnesota and we'll have to make some other adjustments. Um, but my question is, I think that'll uh, really affect manufacturing in Minnesota. So is upgrading the skills of manufacturing um, in your plan? Uh, everybody, when I was growing up and uh, I grew up in the 70s, 60s, 70s and 80s, uh, somebody working in a manufacturing plant typically came home with grease underneath their fingernails. That doesn't happen all that much any longer. Um, much of the manufacturing has been computerized and, 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 and such. So, and we've had significant layoffs in manufacturing. Um, is that within your plan or your skill set of training some of these uh, men and women that work in these jobs to upgrade their computer skills, uh, mm -hmm. upgrade you know, some of the other skills that they might need for manufacturing? Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, you know, we look at all the high demand industries and what skills are needed. Um, the local boards have already been doing a great job there trying to expose young people and youth um, to what career options are available there. So that's definitely something we would focus on. My other question is, when do you expect to have estimates of what this is all going to cost and how much more or less you're going to need? Um, you know, and how much more should we request out of the CARES Act for, you know, the Minnesota Job Skills Partnership? Mm -hmm. Well, that's something that we would, I would work closely with our local boards on and as well as DEED, thinking about uh, what's needed. Um, uh, as I said, you know, we are looking at um, funding through the National Emergency Grants. We're working on a grant application right now with DEED um, and I'll of course, also we'll be working through the MJSP, um, but that's something we can work on and, and get back to you with. Well, again, as I said earlier, we have four weeks left, and if you're going to want us to help at all, you need to come up with it sooner rather than later. Okay. Uh, any, uh, one last time, any questions for, for folks? Chair, Representative Zhang has a question. Representative Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I guess my question, uh, is a little bit more so on um, probably to the deputy commissioner. I'm curious uh, about um, UI and um, when folks are calling in, uh, I, I, I'm curious to know if you guys are collecting data on who's calling in, 
uh, where they're calling from geographically, um, and uh, if if they're a minority, uh, um, age age group age group demographic uh, information like that. Um, yeah. Mr. Chair and representatives, I so we collect uh, information. Can I ask? Can I ask sure. who this is? Could you identify yourself for the chair? Chair Mahoney, this is Hamza Warfa, Deputy Commissioner okay. for Deed. Thank you. Uh, and so we we do have information, demographic information about the UI applications. I am not certain if we have uh, demographics on who calls. Uh, so this is not my area but I would be happy to include that as part of the follow-up uh, to this. Uh, uh, and just to clarify, if we collect information on people who call. Okay, and, and I'm asking that, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead, Re Representative Zong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, um, Mr. Deputy Commissioner, I ask that because I've been hearing a lot from my constituents um who come from all walks of life from those who uh, may not have access to the internet uh, to those who do not speak english to family and friends who live in greater minnesota saying that uh, they're having a lot of issues or that they're trying to contact the uh, ui and they can't get through to anyone so i would just be curious on knowing this information um and trying to understand uh, obviously, um, how uh, if, so, if something like this will come up in the future, uh, how we can uh, be um, uh, ready because obviously that's um, something like this has never happened before. And I think uh, it will be to our benefit to have these information so that uh, in the future, um, when we have something like this that comes up, we can uh, be better prepared for it. And so I really appreciate uh uh, I would appreciate a follow up or email with uh, data on this. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Do we have any other questions for uh, Ms. Fortney? Mr. Chair, we have Representative Haley and then Representative Hassan. Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me with another uh, question. It's actually a comment um, to your point and the questions that you keep asking the presenters this morning about where is the need and can we identify uh, of that need so we can be strategic in applying our resources. Um, I can forward to the committee, I serve on the governor's work development board and the most recent meeting we had was just in March and we received a presentation about the manufacturing needs across the state of Minnesota. Um, the highest needs, 96% is in CNC machining, uh, mechanical engineering below that, machinery maintenance workers, automation, et cetera. So, we have the data, it's as recent as March from one of our um, state uh, economists that's focuses on the manufacturing industry. So I'm, I, I'm just surprised, I guess, that we're not hearing that from the presenters today so that we, uh, we can not be waiting and we can align our resources. And I will forward the presentation to all of you. Thank you, Representative Haley. Uh, and we will probably be touching base with the, uh, um, the work, work, workforce training programs across the state as we try to make these decisions. So that will be helpful. Representative uh, Hassan, did you have a question? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is for Ms. Uh, Fortney. Um, how is the, the board? So this is what I have heard from uh, the immigrant community that and and um, other communities of color that the local boards are having problems with having enough diversity. And um, can you address how are you guys partnering up with um, immigrant community organizations that are serving communities of color and immigrant community that are the front line of this work? And how are you guys uh, combating the challenge that um, people are making the claim that you guys are not diverse enough? Mm -hmm. Sure, thanks. Um, yes, all the local boards um, have partnerships with community-based organizations um, that serve um, populations of color, um, serve uh, refugee populations. Um, it's always something we're working on. Um, it's addressed in, um, of course, the Minnesota 
uh, we owe a state plan um, in our local plans um, about how we go about that. Um, it's always something we're, we're striving for, seeking to div diversify our staff um, and continuing to, to do outreach with those communities. So um, it's definitely on the forefront um, of all of our minds in doing this work and making sure that we're reaching um, the communities that both that, that best need us. Um, but it's also something that we're continuing to, to, to work on and strive for. Representative Hassan, do you have a, a, a no, quick follow-up? No, I'll be good. I'll be good. I won't, I won't ask for a follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I will ask for a follow-up here. Could you give to our committee members a, um, how about if we just ask for the, the makeup of your boards? So whether it's in St. Paul or Minneapolis or uh, Halleck or Worthington or uh, Winona, uh, are there members of people of color on the boards themselves that actually get to make the decision because that is an important piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can only tell you from my experience as a chair of this committee, how much input they're willing to give on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the last couple of years, there has been um, a significant um, effort to further diversify the boards. Um, we've been working with the um, deed on changing some policies surrounding um, who can be um, on that board. Um, it's something that um, we're actively working on right now to be able to allow more flexibility in who can sit on those boards. Um, and I'm happy to provide you um, kind of more background on our efforts there um, and what the, the makeup looks like. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions for Ms. Fortney? Seeing none. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you'll sit, you'll stick around for a little bit in case there comes a question. Uh, sure. We have three more testifiers and we have about a half an hour. So I don't really know exactly how we'll get through. But uh, again, thank you very much. Um, uh, our next testifier is Eric uh, Muscher. Did I get that even close? <laughs> you were close, but, but your previous statements holds true. <laughs> <laughs> Please identify yourself for the tape yep. and uh, proceed. Uh, Chair Mahoney and members, thank you for having me. My name is Eric Mushler. Uh, I am a program officer with the McKnight Foundation. I am on the uh, St. Paul Minneapolis Workforce Innovation Network, and I'm co-chair of the Policy Committee of the Greater Metropolitan Workforce Council. Uh, I'm talking on behalf of MSP Win, which is a collaboration of a dozen local and national foundations that have invested about $9 million in workforce development in Minnesota in the past seven years, taking a strong systems analysis view of our investments. The focus of our investments and policy work has been getting more Minnesotans, especially populations of color and indigenous peoples into career pathways that can earn family sustaining wages and improving our workforce systems connection to Minnesota businesses that need skilled workers. MSP Win does not provide programming or training directly. We do not receive funds from DEED or the legislature. MSP Win and its members fund workforce development programs. And we work with many of the same organizations that DEED and the legislature fund. We believe our experience as funders provide a unique perspective and appreciate the opportunity to share our thoughts today. So the world has changed with COVID and will continue to. And it's rapidly, rapidly exposing the inequities and lack of opportunities for many people of color and geographically isolated families struggling with part-time work and low-wage work that's just not sustainable. There's a danger that in our need to move quickly to get back to work, that we revert back to the same old ways of doing business that uh, have tended to perpetuate inequalities. The workforce system mostly drives individuals toward whatever available job there is, period. As the health crisis recedes, we're taking a longer term view, which is kind of a privilege of philanthropy, but, but as the health crisis recedes, we believe this is an opportunity to pivot and modernize our workforce system to one that truly develops career opportunities to quality jobs for those that are, for anyone that's touched by the system. At the same time, we think this, that this can better serve the changing skill and talent needs of employers 
as the information and technology economy continues to change the workplace. This should be a time for change and bold action. While we do not know the extent of the economic damages this crisis will do to Minnesota families and businesses, now is absolutely the right time to start looking at strategies that, we will, that will help Minnesotans get back on their feet. MSP Win would offer a few thoughts as you begin to look at the ways the legislature can help. We should set overarching goals for the workforce development system. What do we want the state's investments to accomplish? What industry recognized credentials are achieved? Who are the priority populations we need to serve? And what occupations will be more valued in the future of work? Which offer career pathways and increased income? We should also recognize the difference between regions of our state and allow for tailoring based on regional labor and workforce needs. Providing greater flexibility in times like this is an opportunity to spark innovation from the ground up. We should identify industries which post COVID will likely ramp up quickly and will need workers and begin to work to make those connections now. Keep in mind that the dislocated worker program is not the only way to serve workers who have been laid off. There are more flexible ways to use state resources to help all workers. We also hope that you will look to and push the federal government to increase significantly investment into community and technical colleges and workforce development systems. Now would be the right time to invest in places where large numbers of people of color turn to to reposition themselves and prepare for work and a career. At the state level, due to falling revenue, we expect that many will be asked to do more with less going forward, and it's imperative that we're strategic as possible. We ask you to consider targeting at least a portion of the Workforce Development Fund on training efforts in high-demand industry and occupations that provide family-sustaining careers. We also ask that you look at expanding investments in the proven career pathway models because they will help Minnesota's short and long-term workforce and economic needs. For example, you can go and look at the online Uniform Outcome Report Card on DEED's website and see that the state's Pathways to Prosperity program clearly shows this model is successful in terms of increased income for participants and fulfilling employer needs throughout the state. This crisis also highlights the need to ensure our workforce development system is aligned with other state investments, economic development, human services, and education being the most significant. Make sure we're maximizing the funds available to help workers sustain themselves, become more resilient, and increase their income. Similarly, how do we align philanthropic and private investments with our public investments? Minnesota philanthropies invest between 12 and $15 million a year in workforce development. Just last week, MSP Win allocated more than $500,000 to organizations to help them organize and advocate for training and system reforms that are directly informed by the people who have experienced inequities and gaps in the current system. We can and should do better. This is an opportunity to, to align and work more effectively together to provide flexibility with an eye toward learning new and better ways of working. We can garner valuable insights on system improvements and greater capacity to benefit low income and populations of color with the skills and education that is critically needed, not only to recover from the crisis, but to build a stronger and more resilient workforce for the future. Now, I'll not pretend to have all the answers for you today, but I hope that these thoughts I've shared are constructive. There's no one program we can fund, no decision we can make that will solve the current challenges we're now facing. It's going to take a coordinated and strategic effort in Minnesota to have a strong recovery. And MSP Win and Minnesota's philanthropic community are ready to work with all of you in that effort. We hope you will take advantage of our experience as workforce development funders as this discussion continues. So thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very uh, provocative testimony. Uh, I have been a big advocate of uh, improving how we do our workforce training. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Mr. Musher? 
Um, I will I will take advantage of this pause and ask that uh, if I'm not going to be here next year, I don't think we can do a lot to change the system in the next three and a half or four weeks. Um, but I would love to have any of your literature that you could send to the committee members as a whole or send to my committee assistant, uh, Michael, and he will disseminate it to the committee itself. Um, and I highly recommend that the committee members take the time to read it because we are, we should take advantage of every crisis and improve our system and how it works and how it trains. You just heard Representative Haley talk about 95% of the need out there from these manufacturers are CNC machine operators. Uh, that's, a, that's a very well-paid position, typically over 50,000, and that certainly moves someone out of poverty. Uh, um, so with that, I will uh, move on to our next testifier, but I, again, I wanna thank Mr. Musher and the uh, Minnesota uh, MSP wins. I can't get all these acronyms <laughs> down anymore. And for, fortunately in about three weeks, I won't have to. Thank, thank you so much. And I do hope that, that uh, I think the business community and the philanthropic community have very much interest in modernizing a workforce development system. And so I think this is a great opportunity to, after the crisis, the health crisis, really look at how we can make modernizations that will really address the inequities that exist in popu with populations of color in particular um, to really build on career pathways with more sustainable wages and career ladders. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative, we also have a question from Rep. Dabney. Representative Dabney. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mushler, you, maybe I just need to hear it again, but you, you, you touched on the issue area that I wanted to question you about, which is previous to the current crisis, we had growing uh, inequality uh, with the benefits of the economy going largely to the top uh, ranks of, of wealth and not to the people who are actually creating the wealth. Uh, what are the best strategies uh, as we rebuild after this to make sure that families are better supported so they're not falling through the cracks as, as too many families are now and get um, a more appropriate portion of the wealth that they create? Um, uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, the focus around uh, economic mobility is an area that I think philanthropic, philanthropies are very interested um, even more so now because of the inequities that you that you point out. And so if we think about the needs of the changing workforce, what are the ways that um, the provision of accreditation working toward degrees that offer opportunities for economic mobility? So is the workforce development system uh, more based and connected with the community and technical college system in ways that allow for more credentials, more uh, stackable credentials toward degrees, which is we know a way that uh, workers will earn more. Um, so that's sort of one of the ways that I think um, in workforce development, we can accomplish more of what you're talking about because those inequities are really just exposed through this crisis. Mm -hmm. And I think in the pivot, when we move out of the crisis, that's exactly the way we can take advantage of, I think, new opportunities and investment coming from the federal government in particular. But we can't do work the same way that we've been doing it. We need to think of new ways and be innovative and modernize that system to actually support career pathways, not just getting person, a person a job, which we know are, are um, a lot of part-time work, a lot of, we need to begin to value what an essential worker is. And I think this crisis actually brings that up in a way that we would never expect. Essential workers right now are people that we uh, you know, see in the grocery store and keeping it open. 
Um, so I, I do think there's a lot that will be um, presented post COVID crisis that are opportunities to pivot and really focus on more equitable distribution of opportunities and wealth. Thank you, Mr. Mushler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My, my concern, Mr. Chair, is that uh, coming out of the Great Recession, we saw increased inequity and increased disparities. And we can't afford to have that compounded by how we exit this uh, current crisis. So I, I hope that's something that the committee will, will keep an eye on and, and uh, help Minnesota develop some strategies that uh, reverse that course in our society. Thank you again. Uh, did Chair, we also have a question from Representative Zhang. Representative Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, this question is, uh, I guess this question is all for all of the testifiers. Um, and I ask this question because I have constituents and family members who, um, who, who, are, who are tax paying people, uh, but do not have access to a lot of the benefits out here who are undocumented. Um, I'd like to know what your, what your institutions are doing um, to address um, our undocumented population during this crisis and what you're doing in the future. Uh, rep uh, Mr. Musher. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give the, a, a, a quick response that's sort of from a philanthropic perspective. Um, in a crisis, uh, we, we looked to government as, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the, the, the most immediate responders. And, and I have to give really a shout out to the tremendous efforts of DEED at this point um, in, in UI benefits. And, and I know there was an op-ed <laughs> uh, in today. The, the paper today that outlines the response and, and its relationship to other state responses. Um, but I, I do think that in philanthropy, we look to those gaps and, and you've just identified when systems don't work for populations and growing populations and smaller numbers of populations. Um, so philanthropy through some emergency responses uh, is actually targeted on those uh, undocumented uh, places much more so than I think the larger policy response is able to. Um, so that's just one example. Um, I know in small business, this is actually a really important issue and that uh, the current policies that are in place with the CARES Act are not going to reach a lot of the immigrant businesses, some whose owners are undocumented. So we are looking for ways to support that those gaps because those are the gaps that will help the inequities that um, Representative Vine uh, uh, brought up. Representative Zong, we're running close on time here. Do you have uh, anything more to, to add or to ask? I wanted to hear from D too, but... No, they weren't here today. <laughs> you have, you, 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 you know, the unemployment is, is a big issue uh, and we will be disseminating uh, contact information to uh, uh, the people who were here today to ask more questions because we, we kind of filled up the, uh, the agenda. And I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'm gonna move on. Thank you, Mr. Musha. Uh, I appreciate the input and I have always admired the work of MSP. Uh, Thank, you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Joe Hobbit from uh, the president of the American Indians uh, OIC and the chair of the workforce next. Could you identify yourself for the tape and uh, um, and proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ten, at least ten <laughs> minutes, because I think we have one we have one person after you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Dr. Joe Hobot, President and CEO of American Indian OIC. Uh, I am here also uh, re representing two large consortia uh, of nonprofits that are specifically working in the workforce development space. Uh, MESC, the Metropolitan Employment Service Consortium, and, and then, as you mentioned, Workforce Next, which is a culturally specific uh, consortium of workforce development providers. 
Um, just to give you, a, without going over the entire roster, we have over 25 nonprofits represented within these two collaboratives. Uh, just a few of them are American Indian OIC, Northwest Indian Community Development Center, Summit Academy, OIC, Hmong American Partnership, Clues, Avivo, uh, Emerge, Hire, Jewish Families and Children's Services, uh, just to name a few. I'll, I'll spare you in the interest of time being complete roster. But we are the practitioners that are in the field right now doing the work. Uh, collectively, we have about 53,000 Minnesotans that come through our doors annually to receive services. Um, and uh, I think the good news here is that we are strategically well positioned to do this work on behalf of the state of Minnesota. But uh, as been mentioned by many of the other testifiers, we are in, uh, you know, encountering significant challenges with this current crisis. Um, we are noticing that uh, you know, resources are going to be integral to what we are able to accomplish as we work uh, to play our role in the recovery phase of this crisis. Um, we are have really adeptly transitioned over into internet-based services, but we are confronted with pre-existing disparities such as internet access and IT hardware access by our clientele. Uh, and with the work uh, in partnership with DEED, we are looking to also increase flexibility for how we deliver our workforce programs and services. And uh, I think just kind of circling back to the, some of the other comments that were made uh, previously, we, we are already have identified and are working within these key sectors for employment that are as resilient as possible with the economy, in particular manufacturing, IT services, uh, construction, healthcare, direct service provision. What we are confronted with is we uh, are all really kind of staggering with the with the huge amount of unemployment insurance claims that are coming forward north of four hundred eighty five thousand um, dollars. Not to be an alarmist, but to be proactive. Uh, this is akin to kind of standing on the shoreline after the earthquake, wondering where the water went. We know that this is going to have ripple effects throughout the economy. Uh, in a secondary phase as we try to put people back to work. Ideally, I think you had made comments earlier, Chair Mahoney, about we'd like to see people return to the to their positions that were lost prior to the, to the crisis, but we don't know if that's going to actually be the case. And so there's going to be a preeminent focus on being able to provide training, uh, candidate refinement, and then employment placement, leveraging our strong community connections to employers throughout the state of Minnesota. And I think also just to add a finer point on who we are, we also have... Uh, presence throughout the state of Minnesota. We have operations in Rochester, uh, Worthington, Bemidji, throughout the greater state of, of Minnesota, as well as in the Twin Cities area. So, I mean, to meet this challenge, uh, we're ready. We're in the field. We've been doing this work for several decades, but we're, it's all about scalability and meeting the clients where they're at. Uh, and so resources are going to be absolutely integral to how we approach our work and to the, the amount of, of folks that we can engage with. Uh, we're gonna need increased flexibility to make sure that we meet uh, the, what we refer to as a comorbidity of challenges. Uh, many of our folks, uh, we've, we've made great strides in placing people within the workforce development system. But well, you know the, the FIFO rule, first in, first out, is what we're seeing is applying here. So as this sharp contraction in the economy occurred, it's our people that have been first on the firing line that have been laid off. And so we're going to have to re-engage with these folks. We're going to have to skill them up. And we're going to have to get them placed. And we're going to have to meet the needs in a hurry, along with all the other multitude of barriers that are, that are concurrently uh, being experienced by our clients. Uh, with that... Um, you know, I, I think that we are, are, are well positioned to work with our, with our communities because we're embedded within these communities. Uh, they trust us. They've been utilizing our services for well over 40 years. So in the interest of time, I, I think I'll, I'll turn it over to any questions. I don't want to hog up the whole uh, airspace, uh, blathering about what we know to be true. Uh, but I think that we are, the, we are the good news in this situation, that we, you have a strong network of employment service providers uh, and trainers within the nonprofit space throughout the Twin Cities and the greater state of Minnesota as reflected by MESC and Workforce Next. Well, thank you, Mr. Hobart. Um, are there any questions by members? Are there any questions by members? I know that uh, I will fill up a little airspace here and to find where our shy members are gonna come up with a question, I'm sure. Uh, I know the work that you've done, uh, and you've done a great job of it. Uh, I know there's been difficulties, particularly last year, and I have heard people, I've heard you and your organizations um, uh, be nice about uh, how you phrase the funding that came out of the uh, jobs bill last year. Um, uh, some of it not of my liking either. So uh, I know you're at a, at a 
the organizations that you mentioned, many of them are stressed at the present time for funding. Um, and we will see what we can do over the next couple of uh, three or four weeks. It will be difficult because as you heard early on, um, there is really no general funds left in the bank account right now. And uh, if I give, if we as a committee give to uh, one, we have to take away from another right now. Uh, that, uh, those are the instructions I've gotten from the, uh, the Speaker of the House and we will do all we can. Uh, are there any questions before we move on to Mr. King? Any questions? Mr. Chair, if I could just interject, I think that uh, is definitely, uh, you know, we, we understand the position that, that, uh, that your chair, your committee is operating in and, and the position of the state. The, the reality is with 485,000 individuals now on unemployment insurance, we have an economic crisis within the state of Minnesota. And ultimately, the recovery is going to be based on what you put into it is what you will get out of it. And so if the recovery is something that we're focused on, particularly with communities of color uh, and those within uh, our community that have now sought refuge within government subsidized programs, we want to return them back to the payroll and get them off the government dole. We want to reduce the stress on government subsidies and actually increase the tax base. And so ultimately, it's an investment, and it's an important investment. So what you put into it is exactly what you'll get out of it, and the recovery will be shaped and molded by that investment. And so I'd encourage the committee and, and the state government offices to, to, to really kind of postulate that, that context there as you move forward. We will try. We will try. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for coming to the committee today, and hopefully you'll continue your um, advocacy for funds and um, uh, the ability to do the job that you've done for the last 40 years or better. Thank you again. Uh, members, we're going to move sir. on to uh, Mr. King and Summit Academy. I, I think you all got a couple of uh, uh, pieces. Oh, and we got, I'm going to, before we go to Mr. King, uh, we have, I hope you got it electronically, the Minnesota Business Partnership letter, uh, speaking of that, and, um, and I think they even mentioned Summit Academy in here, and then we had a letter from Ujama Place uh, to myself, uh, outlining what they do and what their look and their, their hope is. So I hope you get a chance to read those. Those are both, in, both Summit Academy and Ujama are uh, important and vital parts of our community and both in uh, job training and in recovering and moving people out of poverty. So with that being said, Mr. King. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, please Mr. Please identify Chair. yourself. I'm Louis King, uh, President and CEO of Summit Academy OIC. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before. As many of you know, I'm a former soldier we taken a hit, we took cover, and now it's time to begin to develop the situation, turn fire and move out. So Summit's approach is to accelerate and scale job training uh, so that we can help people get more money. At the end of the day, poverty puts people at risk for all the things that we see. And so we've developed an employer-driven uh, matriculation management system that connects employers and workers to high paying jobs without college degrees. Currently, uh, we're in the midst of a COVID recovery strategy. Our first, uh, first priority is protection of the students and staff, uh, force protection. And so we've gone to virtual uh, online information sessions. They can no longer come and tour the building, of course, and online registration. When we reopen, we'll have social dis distancing classroom management, which means we'll lose about two thirds of our seats. So we will deploy on-campus distance learning uh, utilizing our test labs, home-based distance learning, and we will acquire more space. In addition to our former uh, offerings, we are now bringing online financial services specialists, cybersecurity, um, estimating and building information modeling. To give you an example of what building information modeling is, in the event you wanna build a new house and you decide on a 10-foot marble counter and suddenly the price tag goes way up. This software allows you to change it to four mica and three feet and make it something reasonable. It's going to change the way that builders do their business. Finally, 
our medical administrative assistants, health informatics folks, and medical insurance specialists will also be part of this fight. We have the community health worker. Uh, we could bring it back to become part of those tracers that are out there. I do want to revisit the uh, financial social services specialists. We're in conversation with a major employer now, a bank, who could never believe they'd send their people home to do the work. Uh, we will now begin providing them with employees starting in November. And so our folks will get used to working from home as well as coming in to the office. We're also in discussions uh, with the precision manufacturers, we're recognizing that it is a strategic issue to rely on other nations during times like this. Chickens are truly coming home to roost and we must develop a strategy. We cannot go back to the old way of doing business. And I've heard some of the remarks, but tough times require tough decisions. And we have to allocate resources for these types of, uh, these types of issues that face us today. So what's the point? One of the things that we're most concerned about is the people who were in those low paying jobs and who are most vulnerable and are now on the sidelines. During this pause, it is an opportunity for them to tool up, get short term training that doesn't require a college degree, 20 weeks, no out of pocket costs, and go from roughly 10 bucks an hour or $21,000 a year to 35,000 with on the job paid training, employer inv involvement. We're in conversations right now to enable our credits to transfer to the, um, to the technical colleges in North Hennepin Community College. We'll also uh, teach them to take advantage of the employer's education package and employer training. And when our credits transfer, they won't have to uh, reapply to get into the school. So that blue section you see, the Summit Academy, the community college, and all the employers are designing the programs together. The gray area shows where the students get their um, immersion. And the most exciting part about this, if that if there's somebody else in that household making $15 an hour, the day that our people start, the household goes to $65,000 a year. And we gotta talk about money because these people are poor and going back to those dead end jobs that pay a little bit of wages, is just gonna keep them stuck there. So we have to take this opportunity. With the um, bank that we talked about, within nine months, the people are eligible for promotion. And then finally, within two years, our target is to get our people to $50,000 a year, which would create a household income of 80,000, putting them into the middle class. We've tested this approach uh, previously with IT employers, and we're now expanding it to the financial services. And again, we look forward to working with the manufacturers and creating that new modern workforce to meet the challenges of today. Our growth. In the previous year, uh, we trained roughly 1,000 people, including our GED, 900 coming through the adult program with the 452 people getting uh, placed. That is a 50% um, enrollment to placement ratio for a large program such as ours. 29% is the 75th percent. 29% is the median. And 75% is the, I'm sorry, 40% is the 75th percentile for training programs over 500 students. So the bottom line is, if you look at uh, the 452 that got jobs and the 540 that graduated, 90%, um, nine out of 10 people get jobs. Further, we come to the table as a partner. Uh, we have a private donor um, that has been, we've been dealing with who's willing to put up $3 million over the next five years uh, to support these efforts. And we, we're inviting the state to join us. We've also, uh, receive federal higher ed support funds of $600,000, which will allow us um, to help our students with things like rent, childcare, transportation, food. This is something we've never had before. We also raise uh, $2 million annually on a, uh, from private fundraising. That is in, that's individuals and a golf tournament. Of course, the golf tournament is um, canceled this year. So we'll go to an online, um, type of deal to get people to buy seats uh, for the students. 
that concludes my presentation and I will take any questions that you have. Members, if you have some questions, we are at the end of our time, but we will extend it just a few minutes. So. Uh, Representative Robbins has one, Chair. Representative Robbins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. King. I really uh, appreciate your presentation and the exciting outcomes that you are achieving. And I just wondered, what would be your advice for us as a committee about how we can retool some of these existing career force programs or other trainings that the state provides to um, make sure that we're more aligned with the current needs in business and that we're getting similar results for the state programs. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Thank you Mr. Mr. King, I, I know you could go on for quite a long time on this one. So briefly, if you could answer. I'll be brief. I'll be brilliant. <laughs> I'll be gone. It's really very simple. Uh, we have a lot of people on the sidelines right now. We have dislocated worker funds. We need to focus on uh, three legs of the stool. Uh, basic technical skills to begin with. Uh, they must know how to read a tape measure or take a temperature or interface with a computer. And we move, must move away from the soft skills training that the welfare reform brought. So we gotta get to hard skills to get that waitress some skills so she can tool up. Secondly, employers must be involved in the design from the very beginning and willing to pay for uh, on the job training experiences and internships so that you can everybody can try each other on. And then third, the partnership with the technical and community colleges, absolutely essential so that they can continue to uh, add value to themselves and move from the entry level job. Very well said, sir. Very well said. Thank you, uh, Mr. King. We appreciate your, your uh, comments and your input. Uh, always well always well spoken about the needs of the people that you serve. I mean, I have to admit that you do a great job and uh, I'm big, big admirer of your computer skills and the uh, training that you just put on in the last couple of years. Uh, so thank you. Thank you again. Um, thank you for the opportunity to serve. Members, we are past our time and I was informed that you know, we need to uh, stay within our, our allotted time. So with that, unless there's any comments uh, very quickly, uh, I will give you a minute. Otherwise we are going to be done here today. All right then, uh, members, there are, we will probably try to have some caucus meetings uh, with the GOP and the, uh, the DFL. Uh, separately so we don't uh, make a mess of the um, open meeting law. I hope in the next day or so to facilitate one of those, either this Friday or, or Monday. And um, with that, I think we all should leave and let the next committee get going. Thank you again.